studying God's Word with us. I'm Carol Brooke. I want to invite you, won't you share with us for just a little bit of time in the Word of God as we bring you our program that we've called From House to House. And we are in the midst of doing a series that is in 12 parts. We hope you've been with us before as we have progressed in this series. But if you haven't, we believe there's something that will be in it for you today if you'll stick with us. And we've called this series, He Is the beautiful bridegroom, as you see him portrayed and described in that little book called the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. If you read the Song of Solomon, you will find that it's like looking in a photo album of the Heavenly Father, where he shows the growth pictures and the development of those that relate to him, whether it be on an individual basis or if it be on the church at large collectively. And it is a symbolical book that gives us uh, inspirational thoughts and principles of how to grow in the Lord. I want to grow in the Lord, don't you? I've been walking with him a long time, but I know I still haven't attained and there's more growth ahead. I encourage you, get your Bible. And ladies, let's go back right now uh, and let's turn to the book of the Song of Solomon. And we're going to be back in the fifth chapter where we have uh, use that as our basic text. And we're drawing from verses 9 through 16, just in case uh, you would have the opportunity to read that as you continue with us throughout this series. It would help you in understanding. For the sake of those that haven't heard this series as started before, we would like to just briefly, not to take up too much time, but to say that <clears throat> this is a description of an experience that the bride had in the Song of Solomon as uh, she had experienced the withdrawing of the presence of her beloved. And so she goes out into the streets to find him and she gets pretty desperate and she asks for help of people in her community. <clears throat> and so they want a, a way to identify him. How can they help her if they don't know what he looks like? And so she begins to describe him. And so as we cover the various aspects of his appearance, we're going to see in it not just the natural, but we're going to see a symbolical picture. And like I said before, someone else may teach from the same text. Don't let it disturb you if they bring out a different focus. Because again, it's like the fa facets in a diamond. It has many sides to it. And it does not conflict nor take away. What it does, it just adds more understanding and enlightenment. As long as it's scripturally based, then uh, we can draw from it some inspirational help. They ask her this question in this setting of text that I've referred to. What is thy beloved? And then she begins to give the description of him. And she said, my beloved is. And we've talked about already, as you know, ladies, we talked about his complexion, she described. And she talked about his head. We talked about that. And then she talked his eyes, about his eyes. And then she talked about his hair. So today our lesson is lesson number five, and it's going to be his cheeks, where she answers this question, what is your beloved? And she says, well, my beloved is, and she begins to talk about his beautiful cheeks. You say, well, Carol, you know, I'm uncomfortable with you using the, this word beautiful describing a man. 
Well, the scripture does refer to our Lord as being beautiful. And even David, as rough and tough of a man as he was and the warrior that he was, he said one thing he desired and he was going to seek after that with all his heart. And that was that in the temple of the Lord, he could behold and see the beauty of the Lord. The Lord is beautiful. Not only has all things that he has made been made beautifully, but he himself is beautiful to know and to correspond with. So today, let's consider his cheeks. And in order to do that, we're going to look, ladies, at verse 13. On this particular verse, I'm going to use the Amplified Version. All right. It says, His cheeks are like a bed of spices or balsam, like banks of sweet herbs yielding fragrance. His lips are like blood-red anemones or lilies distilling liquid, sweet, scented myrrh. If you know her description here is all in the category of how sweet, how fragrant, how beautifully precious are his cheeks, the things that they remind her of. Ladies, let's just look at the first part of that verse, okay? And she says his cheeks are like these bed of spices or balsam, like banks of sweet herbs yielding fragrance. I want to remind you of some things about the cheeks of the Lord. Do you remember the occasion in the Word of God, such as in Matthew 26, verse 49, ladies, we won't turn there to save time, but when Judas had betrayed him, the way that he identified who the Lord was to those he sold him to, he said, it's the one that I will draw near and kiss. And so the scripture says that he did kiss the Lord on those beautiful cheeks. And that was his sign to those he sold him to. Ladies, I'm going to ask you right now, won't you turn, save Song of Solomon, as I said before, but let's turn quickly to Luke 22, verse 47. All right, and you that are home, Try to do the same. And the scripture here says, from the King James Version, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Definitely. He betrayed the Son of God, with a kiss on the cheek. You know, the Lord's cheeks suffered a lot of abuse, not only this betrayal kiss of Judas, but the scripture speaks of how that those cheeks, they were slapped, they were spit upon, and the hair was plucked from his beard. Uh, we're going to consider some of these scriptures, ladies, okay? Again, we're using a little more scripture today than we typically do. Would you turn there with me now into Matthew the 26th chapter, verse 67 through verse 68. And it says, this is the King James Version, Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. Verse 68 says, Saying, Prophesy unto us, Thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? They were playing a game. They were mocking him by spitting in his face, slapping him with the palms of their hands, and then they would back up and say, now you tell us which one of us slapped you. Oh, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to endure such taunting when you are the creator of mankind and to have those simpletons turn and think that as though they were in a position of God and all power and that you were nothing but a meek lamb. It would have been very hard to be gracious in an hour like that, don't you think? So they slapped him and they spit upon him. And then, ladies, let's also turn now quickly to Isaiah, the 50th chapter and the 6th verse, where it shows us that the prophet prophesied how that they would pluck the hair off of his face. Isaiah 50, verse 6, 
in the King James Version. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Some of you ladies know what it feels like to use the tweezers and maybe pluck a hair here or there, pluck your eyebrows. It's not all that fun and comfortable, is it? But can you imagine having the hair, if you were a man of your beard, pulled out hair by hair? Such torture, such gall, such nerve that mankind had to abuse the cheeks of our beloved Lord. Little did they realize that someday they would have to stand before him as their judge and look in the eyes of this one that they spit upon, that they slapped, that they taunted, and that they pulled the very hairs out of his face. No doubt, hands fools or hair by hair. Whatever would be the most painful, you can be sure that's what they did. So that was the, what his cheeks actually experienced. But what was our Lord's reaction? What was our Lord's reaction? I'm sure it was a far cry from what our reaction would have been. Ladies, again, we're going to go to my scripture. I hope you don't mind that today we are using more scripture, but we want this to be very scriptural. And so, ladies, turn with me quickly to 1 Peter in the New Testament, the second chapter, verse 22 through verse 23. And I'm going to read this particular text in the Amplified Version where it speaks of how he was reviled. Not only were those cheeks abused, but he was reviled. It says, he was guilty of no sin, neither was deceit, guile, ever found on his lips. When he was reviled and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, he made no threats of vengeance. But he trusted himself and everything to him who judges fairly. This word reviled means to use abusive language. Hmm. The very creator of all mankind who gave to man the ability to speak and even have a language. They turned that language in on him like a sword and they used it sharp as could be with their tongue and they reviled him. But in spite of his abuse, in spite of his rejection of coming as the redeemer of their souls. How did he react? How did he react? Well, we see that prophesied as I would see it in the Song of Solomon of that text we began with, ladies, in Song of Solomon 513, where it says, his cheeks were like these bed of spices or balsam, like banks of sweet smelling herbs, yielding fragrance. So when they slapped the cheek of our Lord, was there a stench that came forth that they smelt? Oh no, oh no. No, when they slapped the Lord harshly, what they experienced was the sweet odors coming out of those very cheeks that they had spit upon as they watched the spittle run down his cheeks and down into his beard and no doubt to his body. How vile, how vulgar. But what they smelt in return was beds of spices.